Hey everyone and welcome back to the Science of Sports video post series on pacing strategies and exercise performance. Yesterday I explained how physiology has historically identified fatigue as a very distinct point, the point at which the athlete has to stop and fails to continue exercise. And for a long time physiologists failed to recognize that in actual fact what we could do was slow down before that point was reached. And that introduces the concept of a pacing strategy so that rather than being failure where the bridge breaks, as I explained yesterday, exercise performance and fatigue are regulated processes. And so what I want to do today is explain a little bit more about the pattern of pacing strategies. And we look at short duration exercise on one hand and longer duration exercise on the other hand and show you how they are paced differently and why that is physiologically significant. So we are building towards this anticipatory regulation of exercise performance which is based on feedback information from various physiological systems and then mediated by the rating of perceived exertion. But one of the most important things to understand is that in exercise science we look at a number of different systems as being potential limiters or regulators of fatigue and these are what have been called homeostats. So these are the systems which your body has to try and keep in some kind of balance. That doesn't mean eliminate any change. So for example, as you're reading this, your, your body temperature is probably about 37 degrees Celsius. And when you exercise, it can go up to about 40, which clearly is a, is a large change, but the body doesn't mind that. But it does have a problem if the body temperature reaches, say, above 40 degrees Celsius, because then we know that you stop exercise. And so a number of physiological systems have been implicated, and you can call those the limiters of performance, according to the model that I explained yesterday, where Exercise science has usually looked at things uh, at the point at which they break. And so these are the fatigogens or the homeostats that have to be regulated. And they include, among others, the cardiovascular system, body temperature, which I mentioned, oxygen content, either in the air or in the blood, metabolites, things like lactate, hydrogen ions, phosphates, uh, blood flow and oxygenation of the brain, energy supply, so that refers there to glycogen particularly, and we know for example, that hitting the wall in a marathon is supposedly because you run out of glycogen completely. And then there are things like biomechanical factors and some psychological uh, factors as well. So all of these are important. And yesterday I spoke about how uh, pacing gives us an insight into fatigue. It's a, it's a window on fatigue. And clearly, if you look through a different window, then you get quite a different view of fatigue. And that's the same thing with respect to pacing. And so if we look at long duration exercise, anything lasting upward of four or five minutes, then we find a very characteristic pacing strategy which is illustrated here by the 5,000 records in brown and the 10,000 meter world records in blue. And you'll see that after a fast start in the opening kilometer, the running speed gets progressively slower over the middle part of the trial. And then at the end, in the final kilometer, there's a significant increase which has been called the end spurt. Now that's obvious and anyone who's ever done any race, whether you're an elite uh, athlete breaking the world record in a 10,000, a marathon runner, a Tour de France cyclist or even a social 5 kilometer fun runner, you know that this end spurt exists. The key is to recognize the physiological significance of that end spurt, which is what I will cover in future posts on this topic. Just to give you an indication of how universal this is, in these 67 combined races, there has only once been an occasion where the fastest kilometer has not come either at the start or at the finish. And in most instances, it's that final kilometer that's the quickest. And so that is, as I mentioned, physiologically significant because it indicates a capacity to increase, which then shows you that these physiological limiters or homeostats are no point limiting exercise. So then you have to ask the question, why do you slow down? when you could speed up at the end. Just coming back to those homeostats, in this kind of long duration exercise, for example, you might consider that things like the cardiovascular, thermal, energy supply, and psychological factors are important. Whereas if you look at short duration exercise, then you get quite a different picture. And so here you see the speed or power output in a 30 second Wingate test, which is a cycling test where you go as fast as possible for 30 seconds and a 400 meter race from eight athletes in the 1999 World Championships. And here, it's quite a different pacing strategy because once you start off and you accelerate into that first segment, 
you just get slower and slower over time. And so there is no longer an end point. There's just a progressive reduction in power output or in speed uh, in these shorter duration trials. And that again is universal. You see the same thing in 800 meter running, for example, even in 200 meter running. And so, for example, when commentators are watching a men's 400 and they're saying to you that Karani James is finishing really fast in lane 5, what they actually mean is that everyone else other than Karani James is slowing down much more. And so, quite clearly, the physiology of shorter duration exercise is different from long duration exercise. And under these circumstances, things like metabolites, uh, factors relating to oxygenation of the brain or blood flow, oxygen content in the blood, and then some maybe biomechanical factors are important, whereas the cardiovascular and thermal and energy supply are less important. And so it's important to understand that when you look at exercise, you always look at a very specific context, and fatigue is context-specific, and so is pacing strategy. So that's an introduction to the pattern of pacing. What I will begin with in episode 3 next time is looking at the model that I proposed in that paper from the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and you can find the link in episode 1. And I'll introduce that model, and then we will systematically go through how that model was created and what the evidence is from those various physiological systems or homeostats that contribute to pacing. So join me then, and we look forward to learning more about pacing.